is a woman called Hannah Arendt. And she is a philosopher for me because she speaks to what makes us human and what makes us citizens. And when I speak of citizenship, I mean what makes us political beings. So when Hannah Arendt speaks of what makes us human, her first step is thought and our ability to think. And she developed that concept, particularly through her work on the Holocaust, the Nazi genocides. And she says that people who do not think take orders and act in a robotic fashion. So what makes us human is the ability to think. And that thought is critical for empathy because without thought you cannot have empathy. So the combination of thought and empathy is what makes us human. And thought will make, make us critical, will allow us to investigate, will allow us to research, to engage, to be citizens that are prepared to critique. And this philosophy is today probably one of the most important things to remember as the world convulses into fascism where you can have people march with arms against Jewish people, uh, where you can have people carry lights, where you can say black people are animals, where you can uh, cruelly beat women in public, um, cruelly acknowledge that you um, what would be a rapist, um, and I'm speaking of the President of the United States, our President going to thank a few weeks ago, uh, a, a couple of days ago actually, about 10 days ago, um, the people who stood by him and wrote songs for him during his rape trial. I cannot believe that anyone would do uh, something like that. So as our world convulses, it's critical for us to ask, how are we different and how are we the same? So if I'm going to start off, I said I want to speak about state power. So the critical question to ask all of, that all of us must ask is what is the state? Many people will say that the state is a tyranny of institutions. And the state is that. If you look at state power in our society and in many other societies, the first basis of state power is patriarchy. Um, the oldest form of oppression. And with that gerontocracy, ruled by old men. We can still see it today, both things. In The state is one that inscribes race on people's bodies in South Africa and globally. It inscribes race on our bodies. It provides the ideological cement that comes out of cultural institutions but constantly inscribes it on our bodies. And I'm talking about the state here in the United States, in France, in uh, the tribalism of many of our uh, African states and so on. Tribalism, of course. Class, uh, the way in which peasants, working people and so on are divided, um, the upper classes. Class is a real expression and a relationship of the state. Religion, we can never forget from this institution, Christian national education, uh, Christian, national, uh, Christian nationalism that was inscribed on all our bodies. Um, those of us who are atheists like myself and the Muslim people, Christian people of different denominations and so on. That inscription of religion through the state on our bodies. Nationalism, and particu that's particularly important today in South Africa because the corollary is xenophobia of nationalism. And in the first instance, xenophobia is practiced not by the poor people who can, can fight over a little bit of food or a house or a small business. That is not where the xenophobia lies. But it starts in home affairs. And it acts through the police. And it acts through the other institutions of the state 
which denies people with a different immigration status, totally different, um, what you call it, uh, uh, discrimination and oppression of people of a different nationality to us, and in our case, particularly African people, um, and dark-skinned people from Asia and, and, and so on. But the state is also different, it's efficient. It, many states bring a critical efficiency that's necessary for modern society. That is to deliver clean water, to deliver running electricity. And it can be effective. It can be effective at that. It can be effective at many other things. The state also very, can put people's needs first and understand people's rights. The state can also, critical for us, when it acts, ensure equality. So it has that complexity, but the state itself is disciplined by capital. It's, there's not a state in the world that has more money than global corporations. And so any state is reliant on the tax base of companies, the employment that companies provide, and the list is endless. So in that sense, states are disciplined by corporations. And that discipline can be a lawless discipline, as in the case of um, the energy companies, the oil companies, the pharmaceutical companies, and so on. Uh, it's lawless towards us, consumers, um, people who use public services, but it relies on a rule of law to enforce its own contracts and to take every benefit that it can from the state. So corporations discipline the state. In the midst of that is an obscene division of wealth and a division of labor. As we're moving towards a workless society where it could be great, it could be superb. I want machines to do everything. I want a little chip in my brain that says, switch on Subura, the new Italian uh, series, really good series on crime. I want a chip in my brain that says, do that. But it can also become a criminal exclusion not only of the people who are now marginalized and are now vulnerable, but of accountants, of doctors whose diagnostics will be taken away from them. They'll become button pushers for computers. Um, so the essential thing to remember is corporations that will have that power. And it is our duty to act in a way that starts disciplining those uh, those uh, corporations. So the corporation's relationship to states and the top 10% or the top 1% is a critical aspect of our work as thinkers and as citizens and above all as students and academics. Um, the worst capture that can happen is the capture of our intellectuals. That's the worst capture that can happen. Not the capture of our institutions but the capture of our thoughts. And as long as our thought, we struggle for our thought to remain free, we will attain, we will, we will be able to overcome this. Now I want to talk specifically about state capture. Um, I've had enormous privilege of living and working with people who on a daily basis commute and they commute on the trains. And for me, state capture, like I said, the state inscribes itself on the body of people. State capture is inscribed on bodies of people. And I hate that term bodies, but because it reduces people to property. It's inscribed on people's bodies. And how does this happen? You have a woman called Sharon, uh, Sharon Daniels, she lives in Ocean View. She was dumped from Simon's Town in Ocean View, where you can't see the sea. You can't really see the sea. And she has to travel to town to work. 
But there's no bus that goes the quick, quickest route, which is through Hart Bay and into the city. She has to go to Fishhook, and from there she has to take the train. That journey is made by people from Masipumelele, from Ocean View, and many other parts of that area. So she has to take the train. If she didn't take the train, her cost of her transport a day would be 60 rand. And her take-home pay is 6,000 rand. Right? Now you make, do the math on that. You, you do the math on that. So she takes the train. Enormous delays on that line. Overcrowding on that line. But nothing, nothing, nothing compared to the central line. That's the southern line. Nothing that compares to the central line, which comes from Mitchell's Plain and from Kailecha. On the central line the other day in Langa, the train was, the, uh, the Langa station was packed to capacity, probably about 300% full because people were outside the station waiting for the trains. Outside the station. So when the train arrived, it was full. What did people do? They pulled out the windows out of the train to get on top of the train. To get on top of the train. I can show you the videos. I'm part of the commuter WhatsApp groups if you, if you want to see them. And you should. <coughs> we really should. Now, that is how people travel. If Jerome comes to work, she's a woman. She is, her body is pressed between men. Her daughter's body is pressed between men. The schoolgirls who travel on the trains are pressed between men. Where's the dignity in that? Where's the dignity in that? And let us be clear about this. There are white people on the train, and I'll speak about a white man now who is a fantastic human being. But the majority of people who are on those trains are African and colored black people. That's the majority of people, black working class people. But in 2002, the train left Cape Town Station and it carried a student and his friend from what was then still known, I think, as Cape Tech to Fishhook. And as the train pulled into Fishhook Station, or in that area between Retreat and, and <coughs> Fishhook, a group of gangsters started trying to rob uh, them. And this chap st uh, stood up. And his name was Jean van Menen. And he was stabbed to death on the train. And his father was a retired human resource uh, person, Mr. Leslie Fumminen, and his mother, Susan Fumminen, were looking for him everywhere, human resources he did in the Navy. And that man started speaking out, created an organization called the Rail Commuters Action, Action Group, and brought 600 people together, and very soon, Poor people from all over the city contacted him for help. And he fought with Metro Rail, he fought with Prasa about security on the trains, about all that stuff. Eventually a case got to the Constitutional Court. He went to court and a case got to the Constitutional Court. And they won. And they were sent back to the High Court to get a safety plan as an order of court. The government immediately announced that it was going to invest billions of rands in train safety. This was 2004. Between 2004 and 2008 9, the rail security started improving. But the huge investments were not properly made. Security was put on the train. What then happened is contracts were given out for new coaches because our rail stock, the, the the newest trains are 30 years old. The newest trains. So the rail stock is very, very old. In Cape Town, 600,000 people use the train every day. It's a main form of uh, passenger transport. Now, the first tender that went out is to a company called Siangena, well, one of the first big tenders that went out. Siangena was responsible for signaling cameras upgrading stations and so on and it was one of those roll of tenders where you start off with a small amount of money and you end up with two and a half billion there are probably about five stations in the country which has seen upgrading and that was around the world cup 
The money's gone. The money is gone. And this is linked directly to state officials in our security apparatus. In the state security apparatus. The second, the second and more famous one was given to a company called Swifumbo because we needed to, as an emergency measure, get locomotives, engines for trains. And why did we need that? Uh, because the stock is old. But we had rail yards that could fix locomotives and so on. Um, we had engineering companies who could build locomotives, but we made a different tender and gave it to a company called uh, uh, Voslo España. But Voslo España didn't sign the agreement. The agreement was signed by a company called Swifambo. And Swifambo is a man called Mr. Joseph Mashaba. I nearly said that other man who's the mayor of Joburg. He's done some good work about corruption, even though he's bad on other things. Um, but what Joseph Mashaba did, he was the only employee of Swifambo and the only director. He had no bank account. He had no tax clearance. And you know, our state is very efficient. We believe in cash before delivery. Cash before delivery. So we gave him two and a half billion rand, of which 800 million rand was kept by Mr. Mashaba. And in a three days pre in Cape Town, he bought 50 million rands worth of property. 80 million rand of that went straight into straight into the ANC coffers, straight into that, not directly. One of it went through Maria Gomez. People here would know, some people here would know who Maria Gomez is. Maria Gomez is one of the president's special companions from when he was in exile. Um, so that's how the, how the money found its way out. Now, why does this matter? Those locomotives were needed. Those signals were needed. Those Everything you need, the, the cameras, the entry, exit at the train, all those were needed to keep our people safe. And that money is, is largely gone. Now what happened with Swifambo and Voslo is this. The tender was written so that Voslo Espana's trains are the ones that we were going to buy. That was how the tender was written. And it was known as Euro 3000. Euro 3000. That uses the same gauge that we use, the same sort of over, overhead um, uh, pylons and so on, and the same rail width. But the tender was initially for leasing, so it was changed afterwards to sales, buy. And then Vasco España came to Lake Montana, who used to be the secretary of the Communist Party in the Western Cape went to old Lucky and said to Lucky, we've got a better train for you. It's called Euro 4000. Euro 4000 is a totally different gauge. And so you would have heard the story of the locomotives that are too tall. They sent two of the locomotives. Remember, we were meant to buy 70 for two and a half billion rand. We were only going to get 50 Euro 4000s. But Mr. Mjimkulu, I can't remember his first name now, the chief engineer of Prasa, Lucky Montana announced that he was an African genius and that he had found an African solution to an African problem and he invented Afro 4000. Dr. Mtimkulu did not have an engineering qualification and did not have a doctorate. Now let me stop there at once and say, this sounds like an Evelyn War racist colonial uh, account of what happens to us African bureaucracy. This sounds like a Riza Kapuscinski uh, uh, description of, of, but it also sounds like Salman Rushdie. Don't forget, it also sounds like Salman Rushdie. It sounds like Zaxan Dan. It sounds like Wally Sienka. Right? But here we have black people who are using their race or our race in order to deny us racial equality, in order to deny us gender equality, and to, in order to deny us class equality, because they're taking 
stuff away from the most vulnerable people. So state capture, to sum up on the question of state capture, state capture for me is that which is inscribed on people's bodies. State capture is what the academics call correctly. It's not corruption in its order, in its ordinary form. It is the capture of institutions. And let me quickly speak, uh, or I put it more colloquially, I would say it is not robbing the bank, which is what we all should do. Go in and rob banks. That's what we should do, right? It's not robbing the bank. It is capturing the entire banking apparatus and stealing out of everyone's grants every week, stealing out of every middle class shop owner's thing. That is what state capture is. And what is junk status? It is blacklisting. And anyone who knows anything about our country knows that probably about two thirds of our country are in deep debt. And most of them are blacklisted. Most really working class homes are blacklisted. Most middle class people are blacklisted and go to loan sharks. So in that sense, the impact of state capture means that our country is blacklisted. The state is captured, our country is blacklisted. Now what happens? The trades that I described is how people experience it daily to this moment. But because the crisis is so deep, the ANC decides we've got to get some efficient person in that board now, because otherwise there's going to be a revolt of communities. So they put in a chappy called Popo Molefe, who was a good friend of, he was in the trial of the Sasa 8 um, with Cisa, Steve Pico's uh, comrades and so on, the trial that Pico last gave public, at a public appearance in. And Popo Molefe went to Robben Island, he came off, he was a great leader of the UDF, he joined the ANC and so on. And Popo was the first premier of um, was Northwest, Northwest province. And then he became a businessman, as these comrades do. So Comrade Popo becomes the chair. Now, you'll hear now why I call him Comrade Popo. He becomes the chair. In his first chair meeting as chair, Lucky Montana comes to him and says, here's the thing for fixing up the Dorenfontein um, rail yard. It's going to cost us 200 million rand, or I don't know, the, it's, it's one of those huge sums that is in the Daily Maverick on a daily basis. And this man says, um, Popa says, but where's the diligence study, where's the ethics thing, where's the, you know, on, on the company? It should be in your pack. Uh, I don't understand why it's in your pack. To this day, Popa Molefe hasn't received it. So he said, until I receive it, and if it's okay, then, we, then the board will okay it. So that stopped there. As he was driving home from this meeting, he hears the public protector saying that Lucky Montana is not giving her information for her investigation into Prasa and Metora. He calls up Lucky Montana and he says, oh, there is an investigation. Does the board know about it? No, the board doesn't know about it. Uh, has the board received the report from the public protector? No, they haven't. The board knows that there's an investigation, but they haven't received the, the interim report. Next day, Lucky resigns five months ahead of time. Still in his post, he immediately hires a bunch of security, MK vets, in Joburg. And the MK vets start toy toying around Popo Molefe's house. So, what happens next is Popo Malefe gets this report from the public protector who says that every contract above 10 million rand has to be investigated by Treasury. Treasury and the Auditor General do a report and find that 216 transactions over 10 million rand were done. Out of that, only 203 passed the smell test. And that just on, just on a few cases, 14 billion between 14 billion and 24 billion rand had been siphoned off. Now let us remember 
These people talk of white monopoly capital, and one day I'll come back and explain to you why I support it. Um, but that's a separate issue. These people talk about white monopoly capital, but they're enriching global white monopoly capital. The people who benefited from price stuff is Vasla España. The people who benefited are the French company called uh, Alstom. Right? Now, Molefe goes to lay charges with the Hawks and the NPA. They put a small team of investigators with no capacity. The investigators are good people. The investigators say, okay, we're going to give you, um, we're going to summons all the communications between all these corrupt people and we're going to summon their fi financial records. And they succeed in getting it. The Hawks then change investigators. The NPA changes their, their advocates. Meantime, the Minister of Transport, De Poor Peters, decides that she is going to uh, dismiss the board. She dismisses Wolefe and the board. The court reinstates him. Right? Then she convinces people with small and yellow skeletons on the board that they have to resign. So the board starts becoming incorrect. Popo's term runs out. To this day, there's no board. New transport minister, Joseph Mswanga, uh, Swanga, uh, Swangani, travels to a BRICS conference. Whenever they go to BRICS conference, you have to worry. Look at your purse. Don't send your purse, to cover your purses when they go to BRICS conferences. So Jay-Z decides he's going to sign a new contract for Moloto Corridor with the Chinese for 55 billion rand. The Moloto Corridor will cover 40,000 people. It's necessary that people in the Moloto Corridor get decent transport. But there are different ways to give people different transport. That's affordable, that's sustainable, and that gives people dignity. And they want to put up a fancy rail line that will cost 55 billion rand. So now, cases with the NPA and the Hawks. Mulefe goes to court to get the, N uh, the Hawks to do their job. And the first point the Hawks take is your board is not corrupt. So that's, um, I, anyway, this is in court at the moment. Now, I want to speak, make you happy. And there's great happiness in this. There's great happiness for all of us in this. And there's important thought to be had. And what's important is that none of this would have come out if we didn't have a free press. A limited free press, but a free press nevertheless. It wouldn't have come out because we have a constitution that guarantees that free press. And it wouldn't have come out because we have a judiciary which, as far as the criminal justice institutions go, is the only transformed body in our country. Because every judge has had an open hearing and had their CV scrutinized. That has not been true for almost any other state official that matters. NPA, Hawks, etc., etc., uh, Directors General, they just get appointed. Right? And Parliament does the SABC board, but that's Parliament. Whereas the Judicial Services Commission has any one of us can nominate who becomes a judge. Any one of us can nominate. That's the first and important thing. The second thing is it has people from the academic institutions who are lawyers. It has people who from the bar and attorneys. And it has different political parties. And above all, the judiciary has a very strong say in it. Right? So that is enough to make you happy. But there's more in that the people, the commuters on those trains, the way they help each other is they set up WhatsApp groups. And they say, this train is to full, don't get on that train, go to town, get the train there because this train is to full. They set up WhatsApp groups. When a train stops at Nyanga and it can't get to Mitchell's Plain, people walk along the rail lines in order to get home. 
And that is when those commuters stay up until the, the person gets home. And if the person gets lost, they send out an emergency among all the, among all the people in the area. Right? Those are the people who are good. And when we went to meet with those commuter administrators of the WhatsApp group, now this is the, this is the interesting thing about it. <laughs> I was going to say this is the fucking interesting thing about it. <laughs> right? This is the interesting thing about it. You know, our, one of our greatest problems in the Western Cape is the division between African and colored people. And the administrators on these groups are colored people. I mean, someone says a racist thing, they immediately remove, there's no trial. There's no going to the equality court and hearing whether your tweets are uh, this or that. There's none of that. You just get removed. If you make a sexist comment, you're off it. Working class people, African and colored, looking after each other. And when we went to speak to them, one of the critical things that came out is that none of these workers knew the scale of this corruption. None of the workers knew the scale of this corruption. And they prepared to take action. And it is our duty as students, as people's movements and so on, to work with, to not close their voices off and make it our campaign, but bring our power and our knowledge together with their power and their knowledge and let them lead us in this work. Provide resources to help them. So, uh, there's some things which I, which I can't tell you. There's a bunch of old things called the UDF veterans that have got together. They irritate me. Sorry. <laughs> the reason they irritate me is they've suddenly become like, no, let me, let me just be nice first. These are like old comrades. Like you get old Stalinists, you get old Trotskyists, you get um, funny people, liberals and so on. All of us like together and most of them had not been politically active. And some are retired, so they have a lot of time in it. And as people like me get old, in the middle of the night you'll remember something and you'll put it on your WhatsApp. Oh, did you book the venue? That was the latest. But these people wrote letters to the NPA and said, if you don't seize the assets or freeze the assets of Siangena and Swifam, we will take you to court. And they didn't only do that, they picketed twice outside the NPA. And, and uh, Sean <coughs> sent a letter saying, how dare you pick it outside my offices? Uh, you bring him, and we sent, we sent him, a, him a letter. There's bad faith and all, all manner of rude things, he said. He get, got a, a more rude letter back. The office is the property of the people of South Africa. And your office should respect itself and not be corrupt. That is bad faith. Um, so, you know, there are a bunch of us who have built a coalition which has come out of community organizations called Unite Behind. Sadly, it's only in the Western Cape. There's a good coalition in, in, in Johannesburg called Future South Africa. But that's a, co that's a coalition of the middle classes and upper classes. This is a coalition of community organizations. And we need a coalition of the upper classes and middle classes. Don't get me wrong. But the real voice that has to come out is the voice of the commuters who take the trains. Thank you. What sense of the intensity of state capture? I think even for us, we, we read, we hear about it, but the, the detail that you gave, uh, 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 just the, the, how it's so systematically done to, to not only, to not just rob the bank, but to steal the whole bank, to steal our accounts. It's just staggering. The extent of this is staggering. Um, I, I'm not gonna take time in, in chatting to you, but I'm just gonna immediately invite people from the audience uh, to engage exactly with uh, whatever you had uh, thoughts in your mind. Yes, Stephen, yeah, Is there a mic somewhere? Yes, there is a mic, yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a brilliant way to actually work with this okay. idea of state capture, because we're quite numbed by the figures. <laughs> and when you bring it down to commuters' everyday experiences, you can begin to 
get a real grip on it. So, and it's politically very important organization, so it's a staggering. How did you get there? I know the method has always been your members alert you to what is really important in the places they live. And I think that's absolutely key to TAC, to SJC, all, all the organizations. And you have the flexibility, it seems, to perhaps shift. I, I don't know how you do it. Other, well, NGOs often are locked into donor funding, so that, whereas you, with, and SJC initially went to human rights and the xenophobia thing, and you realized actually there's something right here that we've got to engage with. So how did that, <coughs> what are the implications for other social movements and NGOs? Someone asked me about Jacob Zuma just earlier, and I said if we reduced state capture to Jacob Zuma, then it's a serious mistake. There are criminal networks in every part of the state. And they're not just criminal, they're not just criminal networks that are uh, in the state, but there's predatory capitalism, global and so on, and there is rentier capitalists who are allied to them. Um, and to get that around is an abstract, abstract set of con con uh, con uh, concepts. And ESCOM is exactly the same. But ESCOM is not a life and death issue for people on a daily basis. It's not a question of sexual harassment or sexual assault or rape on a daily basis. Um, ESCOM impacts differently. This came through uh, activist forums of Unite Behind. Uh, and for us, it's, look, the nice coalitions in Johannesburg, coalitions of nice people, do good work. Every case that has been before the courts on corruption has been very important. But not every time the Constitutional Court issues a statement and says corruption impacts on the most poor, on the poorest people mostly. But there hasn't been a case where poor people have gone to expose the corruption and how it impacts. Mm. And for us, just to get onto the bandwagon of Zuma must go, mm. Mm. Isn't, doesn't change things fundamentally. For us, it's about what happens after. What sort of society we want to live in. There was a hand in the corner there. Yes, please. Zaki, I'm close to tears. You know, um, I don't know if you can... He's it out, it's Thanks. But just that key word of ethics. On a daily basis, I ask myself, does it still exist in people's vocabulary? I was on an educational earlier today, organized by a tourism forum, and I excused myself to attend this talk. I've been attending a couple of talks because it's so vital in the tourism industry for people to hear. Take them to the beautiful places, but they want to hear on the ground stories. And that is how we can also broaden our links internationally. Thank you. What is the challenge? You are here. Um, we're going to be meeting later with Stephen because uh, we've been asking the question what is it that in, in, in institutions like ours can actually do that is worthwhile, that, is, that speaks to these debates and to these actions? I think uh, I saw Sandy and the people here. The work you guys do is fundamental to how we get things right. Um, I think one of the big problems from now with the student movement is that 
the worst thing the worst thing that happened in post-1994 period is that we didn't create a class of black intellectuals we didn't and the most important thing that black intellectuals or any intellectual needs is history and political economy and those things were absent from every curriculum at most universities. So the question is, and that when the student movement erupted across our campuses, it devolved into a narcissism. It, it woke me up to the importance of rethinking decolonization. It woke me up to it because I also happily sunk into peace and love and harmony. Right? Which is bullshit. Um, but the critical question is that that movement didn't historicize it. And so the ability to understand the history of our country and the history of the world. Because when we speak of ethics, we were anchored in the 60s, 70s and 80s, me from the 70s and other people, by the socialist tradition, which is an ethical tradition. That tradition was killed by Thatcherism and what people call neoliberalism. And it is about re-establishing that tradition. What I would like to see is, also in a, in a practical level, I haven't, I am searching for a decent PhD on the history of railway in South Africa. But there's lots of work on the, on the railways. Um, Steve, you can find me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? But, but there's, there's a lot of work like that that can be done. But there's also getting to understand that a woman who rides a train has violence on her body every day. A young boy who gets pushed off the train because he's a learner uh, and he's not going to work uh, has violence on his body. And when people get back home or they get to school, they will act out that violence, try and get rid of it. And sometimes it comes out violently, but most of the time it comes out through mental health. Um, and that's one of the most under-researched under areas in South Africa and under-serviced areas in, in South Africa, mental health. So there's a lot of topics like that where you can help. But most importantly right now is to assist organizations like you know, um, Equal Education is organizing a day-long school boycott on the 27th of October, or a half-day school boycott. And that's the right thing to do. Why? To keep school safe. Because we had the College Commission of Inquiry. Neither the province nor the, nor, the, nor the national police have taken their duties seriously. The SJC and, and, and Equal Education are in court on the 24th of November with the first substantive equality case before the, before the courts in the allocation of police resources. Police resources are nine times, they're nine times more police resources in historically white areas than there are in townships. So the research you can do in all these areas is critical for, for our work. So to support those, to raise your voice, because I can just imagine a lot of those people saying, why are kids not studying? But they don't think that kids come to school having been shot at the day before or heard, couldn't sleep the night before because bullets were flying in Hanover Park. And so they don't learn anyway. And no one is keeping them or their teachers or, 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 or safe. So it's, it's critical for us to, to bring the alternative perspective, um, the real perspective of people's experience rather than our conception of what people should do. And this is the power of, of your presentation for us, the, the, the way you, you, you began what you shared with us with the story of the woman, the story of the boy, the story of the man who gets killed. It really bring, forces us to think about who are these people that are affected by what's going on. And your, your really powerful step-by-step, step, it's, it's almost like you, you, you're researching 
on your reporting on, on research, what happens on a day-to-day -day basis to ordinary people and how are they, what's the impact of what's going on in their lives? And you write, you know, as, as scholars in this environment, these are the kinds of questions that you ought to be pursuing. And the interesting thing for me, or, or rather the question always is, <coughs> while students are shouting decolonize, what are their choices? Yeah. You know, what are their choices in terms of what they are doing? You know, just the cursory questions uh, to students last year during the, the, the protest, asked them, what is your research, those who are doing masters? And you find that it's things that, you know, are so far removed from the very issues that they are fighting about. And it's not necessarily because the professor said you must do this, because, you know, students ask and want to do their work the research in certain areas, but it's not it's not emerging. You know, there's a lot of talk about decolonizing, but the choices that are made by the very students who are calling for decolonization. But can I can I make a quick quick comment yes, on that? The scholars are responsible for that. The academics are responsible for that, because the way in which postmodernism has entered our academies have destroyed have have, have created this subjectivity that everything comes down to my body and my thought and individualize, rather than the collective. And, and that is what assumed the predominance in the academy. And, and that postmodernism where instead of history, we have my heritage. Mm. Um, my heritage is very important, but my history, our history is much more important than my heritage. Thank you. Am I am I quoting you right? United Behind is the organization. Yes, I, I lived in Fischl for many years now in Musenberg, and and this morning, Loki, who works with me in my house, uh, she had an experience coming from Ocean View just to Musenberg. Um, she made it to Fischl Coquet by taxi, and then because it's cheaper, takes the train. It took an hour and a half with with all sorts of calamities. Um, at the same time, now I'm there, there every household has a rookie um, or equivalent. And, and at this very moment in Musenberg, we have a, a two week or four week arts festival. And you see the most esoteric programs, left, right, and center. And the, the question I have to you uh, two questions How can one link uh, with your organization? for a forum like that Musenberg uh, organization to have a presence, to, have, to, to start activism. And how can people like me and, and everybody else who works with Loki, um, how can we come together to, as a collective to support your organization? Or collaborate, actually. Yeah. You started in 2002 on the Central and Southern Lines, and I'd like us to go back there, but in 2017-18, and not with any, or not in falling into the ANCGA cesspool, but do you think that what the City of Cape Town proposes at the moment, <coughs> will it make an immediate difference to those people's lives, or is it talk, talk, talk? Hmm. Very good answer. Or the only two countries in the world where local metros are controlled by a national government it's Russia and Angola. <laughs> and it's got a national government policy to devolve metro rail to the cities. There's a white paper that's been sitting in national government forever. And so it's not a question about political party, it's a question about what we want, how we want to end spatial apartheid through transport. And it can be done if, if local governments have control over it. And local citizens, most importantly. And then there's a question, just like it that, oh, you want oh. a third question? Yeah. Um, sorry, yeah, just, the, just easy, send an email to info at unitebehind.org.za. Uh, otherwise, try to get my email. No, don't get my email. <laughs> <laughs> It's not united behind, it's unite behind. Yeah. Who in IT? One, two. 
I just want to ask you is because I come from Masi, so I and I actually didn't know the whole commuting on train story until I worked um, in my gap year after the trick. But I had so many friends who learned at Fisher High School with me, who from primary school went on trains, and what I experienced was. Um, like coming from a community like Masi Pumelele, everyone has these frustrations about trains, but no one knows where to voice them. So I just wanted to ask, how does Unite Behind plan on reaching the vast majority of um, townships to let them know that, okay, when you face this thing, come to us, because all this frustration dies down in taxi conversations and people think that they can't change it. I think this is the other area. I'm going to start here and then I'm going to move to the question on, on, on students. This is the other question. Uh, Stellenbosch must have a media department, a really good journalism school value. Um, I don't know how many of you have interned with ground, uh, ground Up. Um, yeah. I don't think very many. Yeah. Uh, sorry? How many? Have you interned with Ground Up? I've written. Intern as did an internship. Intern, oh, intern with Ground yeah. Up or to, to practice with Ground Up. Um, but your media department can do an incredible amount um, by just bringing these things to 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 the fore. Um, so what we want to do, what what we want to do is do a series of good podcasts. Um, it's not going to have the same sound quality that uh, 
NPR, National Public Radio, or any of those things have, because it's going to be mono uh, rather than stereo, because users less data. And 12 minute segments that people can listen to and will distribute on trains. Um, what we want to do is create, you know, there, I think there are five lines, four or five lines Southern, Cape Flats, Central, uh, Northern, and then Northern branches into the rural areas, um, not my rural, uh, still small town areas. Um, rural. <laughs> <laughs> I really do think Stellenbosch is a rural. <laughs> so, then the branch is off. But along the lines, what we try to establish, because here's a problem. If there's one community that has been totally alienated from politics, it's the colored community. You find some really good rap groups, hip hop groups, and stuff like that, and some good sports. But beyond that, people are either in the crazy churches, in gangs, or just in pain. And, 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 and that's a separate question which I'd like to come discuss here one day, probably. Yes. Um, uh, but just the, 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 the way to organize along the line, we haven't spoken about apartheid's racial rail listing, where it's different townships and so on. Um, but along the uh, central line, if you organize a Mitchell's plan and you organize an action committee in, in Kailicha, Areas, different areas, college, and different areas in which is played, and you bring those two action committees together. The reason you have this unity between African and colored commuters is it's exactly the same experience together on the terrain. And then people go to their separate dormitories. That is what, what unites them. And, and, and if we can get commuters into action committees, there's a whole range of things that can be done immediately. Additional buses brought to, to stations, additional security here. You know, there's a whole lot of things that people can put pressure on Prasa Metro Rail, the city, and, and all of us on it. Um, and that's what we have to do. Um, on the question of student research, I'm a complete advocate of academic freedom. I'm, I, I have no problem with it, but I think that our institutions, um, like you say, uh, let's take the example example of, of feminism. As you know better than I do, that there are a range of feminisms, right? And so we can easily, let me, let me not put this wrong, what, what is critical is that we need feminist research in working class communities. Mm -hmm. That is what we need. It's, it's, it's indispensable. If you come from a and this university, then you're in a totally different uh, situation to someone who's come from uh, Paul Rusty Gymnasium to this university. And it's critical for us to be able to do that type of research on decolon... Uh, you mentioned Reclaim the City. I think it's been one of the best decolonization movements in the sense that people are occupying space, actually physical, physical occupations, on the waterfront, black people, working class, domestic workers, and so on, have occupied a public building saying, you promised this for public housing for the last two decades, and you've done nothing, and now you want to sell it off to wealthy developers. You're not going to have that chance. We occupy it. And so, you know, that, for me, that is decolonization, and that's the research that I would like to see students do uh, in, in, in those areas. So it's not... It's not the topic, it's how the topic is applied and the thought that students give in relation to history, sociology, uh, and I hate it, Stephen, but anthropology. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and law and all this stuff. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes. Tell us who you are, because I, I think. My name is Roshnia Rahim, ex teacher. And um, I left teaching in 2000 for health reasons. So I've been in the tourism industry for the past 17 years. Um, so incidentally, Zaki and I grew up in the same area. And, uh, you know, we've come a long way through mutual friends. Anyway, um, what I wanted, something that I ask myself constantly, and I think 
often of a work written by a book written by um, a German author. It's called Voitzig. Um, if one reads about incidents, especially when there are issues such as destruction, is it the criminal, criminal element creeping in like I experienced? in the 70s and 80s, capturing the moment, the opportunity, when innocent people are protesting peacefully in an organized manner to voice show the frustration that the focus is then shifted and people say, you know, why are people destroying the little that they have? If Zaki could just comment on that, thank you. Look, the destruction of the trains, there are two types of things that happen, three types of things that happen on the trains. There are people like myself who will go spray paint the trains um, when I was young, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, right? Uh, there are those sorts of youngsters who do stuff like that. Then there are commuters who get really angry when things are wrong and they'll frustrate, they take out the windows and so on. So that's what happened. But then all of you have heard of copy theft. So how much time do we have? We, we have 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so ground up was given a uh, security memo that came out of Prasa. It was in last week's ground up. And the security memo shows the following in relation to security at Prasa. Obviously all the chaos in management, people being promoted, the good security people being moved sideways or pushed out. And about 1,800 MK vets being employed here in Cape Town, in the Western Cape Metro Rail region. And the vast majority of them have criminal records. Right? Um, now the question is not clear whether those criminal records are the type of criminal record that I have, or the type of criminal record that has come post-1994. And my bet is on the latter, because most of those MK people are the MK Junior League, yeah. mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so the question is there. 20 of the security guards have guns, but no bullets. None of <laughs> this, yes, absolutely. This is an internal memo. 20 guns for the whole of the camp, no bullets. So people can't get firearm training. They can't get firearm licenses because they have criminal records. Mm. They can't get security guard uniforms because they have criminal records. And many of them are criminal. Mm. So what turns out is Popo Malefe is people get a call from the, they get a call from the uh, customs. It says, there's, you exporting copper, we're just checking why you're exporting this copper. Mm. <laughs> Turns out that the now uh, departed head of security at Brasa had signed by declaiming his signature was formed export licenses for copper that Brasa is not using. Sure. Right? Um, so they're criminal syndicates that are operating uh, on the rail line. So that's the one aspect in relation to price out people uh, taking things. Like Helen Zilla saying, people aren't looking after their toilets in Kailicha. Um, you know, uh, they don't deserve it. And I clean my own toilet. Yet someone shits in the bush and comes to clean our toilets. 
right? Um, and then 80, 80 people use the same toilet, who's going to clean it? Right? Um, so, you know, that sort of uh, diminishing of the dignity of communities happens all the time. Both Prasa does it, Helen Zilla does it, the state does it generally. Um, but then you have the second part of it, and that is the security apparatus that we really have to watch. Um, if you look at the killings in KwaZulu Natal now, if you look at the killings in Pumalanga and Natal, if you look at the violence against Abashali Basem and John Lolo, it's, it's, it's a dangerous time in which criminal elements are being used to take out political opponents. So it's not simply entering demonstrations and making them unruly. It's also the deliberate targeting, both within the ANC and in places like KZN, opponents of the AZ, uh, a, 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 ANC with, uh, with, with, with arms. And I promise you, I, I don't know if you remember, the, one of the bodyguards of the secretary of the ANC in KZN was caught with an AK-47 brandishing an AK on social media. Now, no one is allowed to have an AK-47. Has that man gone to jail for it? And where was that used? Give you another... Uh, no, me. no, do, please, yes. You, you, I don't know if you, you... You may know a chap called Jeremy Vieri and Peter Jacobs. They are two old MK people and they set up the gang... Jeremy set up the gang unit for the South African police service. But unlike other police, he knows the townships in a really, in a political way. So he said, I'm not going to go after these kids. I'm not going to go after these kids who sell dacha or mandrakes or tick. I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go after the hardware that is provided to these people. First the guns. First the guns, because that creates chaos in the community. So what he did, what he, you, you can hear me now? Yes. So what he did in relation to that, he set up a unit to investigate guns more. And it turns out that, I can get you the exact data, but the police in Johannesburg had a unit at the Brixton murder and robbery squad that was recycling and taking stolen guns and giving it to the gangsters, selling it to gangsters. One gun, one gun was used for 18 murders in Kailacha. The guns used, a, a set of guns were used to kill 219 children. Guns that have come from the police. So this chap that they caught, this colonel in the police or what major or whatever he is, stuck a plea bargain that he was going to give the names of everyone else. <coughs> They removed Jeremy and Peter Jacobs to not go into all the other people. And some of those other people are in the defense force, are with the arms manufacturers, and so on. And some of those people sell guns to Syria and, and, and so on, coming out of our defense force. So they immediately removed these two people. Jeremy went to investigate taxi violence because the arms took him to, to the taxi violence as well. Literally on coming back from KZN and discovering who's behind this, they remove him from his job. And out of this now, you have a violent explosion of, of gangster violence on the, on the Cape Flats. So, you know, it's, it's easy to see that the criminal networks in the state can easily infiltrate mass movements. But on the other hand, I'm confident that mass movements are stronger than than states when, yeah, mm -hmm. let me. There is one last question here, thank you. The mic is coming. So okay, just, uh, just think big picture for the moment, I know you're a man that can do that. Um, if, if you talk about political power, maybe the two, the, the two occasions in this year where we were mostly disappointed were with the two um, votes of no confidence, one in Parliament and the other one at the NEC. 
And that was a clear demonstration of political power, how you can stand up against all that's been thrown at it. So although mass mobilization is important, grassroots movements are important, in the end it's political power. And if a government doesn't deliver efficient, as ours does, they need to be replaced. Now, let's have your thoughts on uh, 2019 and the, <laughs> the prospects of having an efficient, clean and ethical government in our country and how do we get there? Look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pretend that um, going to parliament is going to solve our problems, but we can't do without decent uh, legislature and without a decent executive. We can't. Uh, we need that. And I think the first five years after Zuma, if we, what I would hope for is a split in the ANC that might have some decent people. And please yeah. let that come. Mm. Good people from the other parties uniting with them and some coalition. But the ANC has to drop to below 47%. Below 47%. And the reason for that is very simple, because some of the smaller minority parties can go up to them, their side for coalition. So it has to drop be below 47%. And therefore, I think what I would like to see personally is a, a centre-left coalition, as opposed to a centre-right coalition. Um, and if we can get a centre-left coalition, the, the first five years has to be taken to clean out critical institutions like, for instance, Metro Rail, like ESCOM, getting the NPA right, getting the, um, getting the, uh, the police right. I, I don't think that, it, personally, I don't think one can rely, the police have to be disbanded, that's my personal view. But let's give it a try, um, right? I feel more unsafe with police around me. Um, so, having said that, I think that there are certain things that we're going to have to do to ensure that there's some form of coalition government, but we're also going to need a movement outside it to ensure that the questions of equality and justice, the question of women go through, the students go through, and so on, put pressure on it so that that movement, that such a coalition does not become a business as usual, save South Africa coalition, save the, save the uh, post-94 South Africa, because we don't want the post-94 South Africa. We want a different country. There's such an agency, maybe just as a last uh, point perhaps, I mean, it, it never ends the way that we think about the, what's possible, what might happen, and you've just painted in response to the gentleman also in another picture. But there's, there's this question that's nagging me that, I mean, with all that you have painted, the picture you've painted for us, the extent and the depth, you know, and the magnitude of, of, of the capture, you know, how broad and deep it is. Uh, and, and when I hear you say you trust in the mass democratic movements, that they are stronger than the state, does that really sit, you know, well in, in, in this just big picture of the, the, the potential destruction of what is it's almost like a tsunami is coming. Sometimes, you know, one wakes up and feels almost like an invasion of the body, like something is invading your body. Uh, and, and, and the question remains, what is our role? I mean, we, the, the various kinds of leadership, the institutions, we're not really showing up, we're there, we write op ed pieces, we, you know, the student leadership, there is uh, social media. There seems to be something that just needs to really crack into this just overwhelming sense of invasion of our lives in, 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 in the most unimaginable way. Mm. Well, two things I'm going to, a few things I'm going to say in response to that. First, the destruction of the labor movement has been a critical factor for our not having a, a, a solid ally that can help build a, a different society. So the destruction, the self-destruction of the, the labor movement has helped with that. The state itself is not one thing. Um, 
and that gives us a possibility of finding, and we have good allies in the state. Uh, few and far between, but there, there are good allies in the state. And they're good people trying to do good things in the state. Um, but there are two things that I think needs to, we need to think of differently. The first is my, my second, one of my other favorite philosophers is a chap called Antonio Gramsci. And he said, he wrote a letter from prison to his sister-in-law because his wife was telling him, can't you just come out and so on. And he said, both in politics and in personal life, if you bash your head against the wall, it is not the wall that is going to break. So we have to look at doing politics very differently. We have to look at doing politics very differently. And by that I mean, our solution is not necessarily going to be political parties. Our solution is going to be a, a number of different types of movements in alliance with political parties. We, we've got to look at different ways of doing politics. And the other thing that has always kept me optimistic is I come out of the youth movement, the student movement that Bert calls. That's where I come from. And young people, whether people who've come out of Fees Must Fall, people who are in equal education, in the social justice coalition, they are so bloody brilliant. And representation is not enough. It's important for my generation to step back, support, and let the decision making be the people whose median age in our country is 26 years old. That's, that's, that's the median age of our country. And our politics are dominated by us. And we have to find a path to our youth who want to, who want a different life. But it is how we find that path. And I think we can. It's going to take time. There's no easy solution to this. But we have to find that path. Thank you. Thank you so very much.